Well, this morning I have a message. As I mentioned last week, we're going to start a series on the Ten Commandments. Amen. And um, so I'm quite excited. Let's begin in prayer. Oh Lord, we come before you. Lord, I pray that uh, you use me, that it be your words that come from my mouth today, and that it help us to become more like you, Lord, that you touch our hearts. I pray in the name of your Son, Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to start with the first commandment. Hallelujah. But before I get into the commandments, there's uh, much confusion about commandments and laws. In the Bible, many references to the law or commandments, some are speaking about the Jewish oral law, which are laws made by rabbis, sometimes referring to civil laws. At times in the Bible, when they're referring to the laws, like the Roman laws, but most often they're referring to the law of Moses. Like in Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, we read, Yes, all Israel have transgressed your law, turning aside what they should not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse of the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us. We have sinned against him. The law has a negative connotation. And it's an actual incorrect translation of the original Hebrew word. Because the word is not law. The Hebrew word is Torah, which means instruction, not law. And it actually means God-spoken instruction. Amen. And note the law of Moses does not mean that Moses invented these laws but rather that God spoke these instructions to Moses, who captured them in writing in the first five books of the Bible, known as the Torah. In Greek, they call it the Pentateuch, but in Hebrew, it's the Torah. It's the first five books of the Bible that captured God's instructions to man. And it is God's user manual for men to live the three H. We talked about this the Torah gives us, it allows us to live healthy, allows us to live happy, and to live holy before God. The three H. It's like an appliance. Everyone here has an appliance at home, a microwave, a TV. It comes with a manual, instruction manual. For example, don't use your microwave while taking a bath. Right? Makes sense? Well, the Torah is the same thing. It's an instruction manual for man to live happy, holy, and healthy before God if we follow it. It's a road map from God to avoid trouble and also to be blessed by God. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, we read, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. Also, we read in Joshua 1 verse 8, The book of the law, the Torah, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The Torah is for our own good. If there's no road loss, you're going to have accidents, right? So in the Torah you have all kinds of laws. You have dietary laws, you have nida laws, circumcision, many, many. And these have been proven to have huge health benefits for those that keep them. And 
God created us and his Torah as our handbook, our instruction manual. So who can tell me when the Torah was first given to man? Any idea? She says at Mount Sinai. Well, it was first written down when God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai. We see here in Exodus 34, verse 27. Then Adonai said to Moses, Write these words, for based on these words, I have cut a covenant with you and with Israel. This is all the words that he was speaking, the Torah, God's instruction. He was telling Moses, write them down. And that's what he did. He captured them in the first five books of the Bible. But is that the first time it was given to man? Did you know that two weeks before they got to Mount Sinai, God got angry with them for not keeping the Sabbath? We read here in Exodus 16, so 18 chapters earlier. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? And then you say, well, wait a minute. Why would he get angry with them? He didn't even give it to them yet. Right? Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So how could God expect them to keep his commandments if he hadn't given them until two weeks later on Mount Sinai? And what about Abraham? Did you know that 700 years before Mount Sinai, Abraham kept the Torah? Look at Genesis chapter 26. Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham was long dead when God told Moses to write the Torah. So how did Abraham know about the Torah? Let's keep backing up. What about Noah? Who can tell me, here's a question for all those that went to Sunday school growing up. <laughs> Who can tell me how many of each animal Noah brought on the ark? In my Sunday school class, I only learned that he went in two by two. It was two of each kind, two of everything, right? And yet, look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. This is God instructing Noah and says, Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate. So, there was two unclean, one pair, but seven pairs of sheep. So there was 14 sheep, 14 goats, 14 beef, 14 antelope, 14 buffalo, deer, elk, moose, now we could go on and on with the clean animals and the clean birds. I don't know if you realize, but there was a lot more animals on that ark than just two of every kind. But the question I have to you is, is this is more than a thousand years before Mount Sinai. And God tells them, takes seven pair of clean animals. How did Noah know what was clean and unclean if it wasn't said until Mount Sinai when God told Moses to write it down? How did he know? How did he know about the Torah? Well, let's keep backing up. We're going right to the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Look at Genesis 4, verse 3 and 5. It came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. I remember reading this a long time ago. I said, why 
is he discriminating like that? They both brought an offering. Why should he get angry with one for bringing him a gift? Like somebody brings you a gift, you're going to be angry with them? Right? It's because he brought, he didn't bring the first fruit. This was a first fruit offering that both Cain and Abel were bringing. And you could bring of, of, the, of the, uh, the fruit of the earth, like the plants, but it has to be the first fruit. Notice what it says here. Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. But Abel brought of the firstborn. He did what was right. And if you go on to read the next few verses, Genesis 4, 6, and 7, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? He wasn't doing well. He wasn't keeping God's instructions about first fruit offering. If he had, God would have welcomed his offering just as much as he welcomed Abel's. But he wasn't following the instructions. But the question I have for you is this. How did Cain and Abel know about first fruit offerings? If it wasn't in, uh, spoken until Moses wrote it thousands of years later on Mount Sinai, how did they know? How did they know about the Torah? You know how they knew? You know that song where God was walking in the garden and speaking to Adam and Eve and they walked together and they spoke together? God spoke His Torah. His instructions for mankind. Can you imagine you buying a TV and it's not until years later that you receive the instruction manual how to use it? Does that make any sense? No. From the beginning when he created man, he spent time and he spoke with Adam and Eve and he told them, he instructed them on all his Torah. This is what you need to know. This is what you need to do and not do. They knew what to eat, they knew what not to do and what to do, and they knew about first fruits offerings. And they passed that on to their children. But some listened and some didn't. Just like today, right? But they knew about the Torah, God's commandments, way back in the Garden of Eden. And it was passed along, word of mouth, from generation to generation. And did it work? Well, for some. It did. But we saw that two weeks before Mount Sinai, God got angry. He says, how long am I going to be, are you not going to keep my commandments? Am I, they were, he was angry because they weren't keeping the Sabbath. And so two weeks later on Mount Sinai, he decided, you know what? They're forgetting, so I'm going to get you to write it down. Then they won't have any excuse. It's going to be written down in the Torah. And they will never forget because they'll read it and say, oh yes, that's the way I've got to give a first fruit offering. This is how I keep the Sabbath. This is what I'm to eat and not eat. And everything is laid out. So, that was the next step. You can see that the Torah, went from spoken to written at Mount Sinai. But it went from that to the living Torah was given, as I said, to Adam and Eve in spoken word of mouth, and then written at Mount Sinai. But did that work? We see that when Israel entered into the Promised Land, it said that they turned away from God. And they went after other gods. And they stopped keeping God's word. So God took the next step. We read in John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word. The Word there in Hebrew is the Vah, is the spoken Word of God that we just talked about, His instructions. And the Word became flesh and tabernacle among us. Amen. Speaking these instructions from generation to generation didn't seem to work. Writing it down didn't seem to work. People weren't keeping it. So He sent His very own Son. The Torah made flesh, the Word made flesh, so that he might be able to walk and live out exactly what it means to keep the Torah. 
all of it. And you know, when you put your faith in Jesus, his Hebrew name, Yeshua, what you're actually doing is you're putting your faith in the Word of God. And putting your faith in something doesn't mean only that you believe in it. You believe it's true, but it's more important that you become doers of the Word. I had a whole message online about faith and believing. And faith is not the same thing. You can believe anything. But faith is when you actually put those beliefs into action. And what does James tell us? James 1, verse 22 and 24. He says, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only. You have to be doers of the Torah, not just listening to it. Because then we're deluding ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man or a woman who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he looks at himself and goes away, he immediately forgets what sort of person he was. That's if you're just a hearer of the word. But if you're actually a doer, that means you've absorbed it. You don't just believe it, but you put your faith in it and you're carrying out God's instructions in your life. So we saw how the Torah went from spoken to written to living Torah in the form of Yeshua himself. And then after Yeshua died, God sent his Holy Spirit to do what? To remind us of Yeshua, the Torah, become flesh, and to write the Torah in our hearts. Look at Jeremiah 31. Behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put, what? My Torah within them. Yes, I will write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. Amen? Note, why a new covenant? What was wrong with the first covenant they made in the desert? Was the Torah, God's law, not right? Was there something wrong with it? No. And why is the new covenant writing the same Torah on our hearts? You see, there was nothing wrong with it. The Torah is perfect. Everything that God makes is perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. Right? The problem with the first covenant is that they broke my covenant. That's the problem. They didn't keep it, as we saw. Even though he wrote it down for them, we saw how they turned away from him. And so the next step, as we saw, was to send his own son. The word made flesh. But that still they didn't keep it. And he sent the Holy Spirit to do what? Write it on their heart. Write what? My Torah. Amen? The same Torah we're talking about. When you receive the Holy Spirit, what does he do? He puts those instructions, his Torah, on our hearts. So who is the law for? Some argue that the Torah is only for the Jews. The law was actually given to the entire world. Though his people Israel, through his people Israel, that were to be the light to the nations. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, 
just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should not, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. And in Isaiah 51, we also read, Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. The instructions, the Torah, will become a light to the nations. God had always planned, yet chosen Israel to become His light to the nations. That when people would see how they are blessed, for keeping his Torah, it would draw people to them, and they would be able to share the Torah with all the nations. The law of God was never intended just for Israel. The entire world is under its jurisdiction. They are God's instructions for mankind. You know, what to eat, what not to eat, and all the do's and don'ts in the Torah, they're not just for the Jews, they're for every human being. They benefit all of us. We read also in Romans chapter 3 verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. The whole world is held accountable to God because of His Word. Romans 10, 12, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. Amen? If the law did not apply outside Israel, then they could not sin. and would never be subject to God's judgment. The Torah is our user manual for the whole world because it also defines what sin is. We're going to see that on another slide. Some say, wait a minute, when Yeshua came, He came to put an end to the law. But is that what actually says in the Word of God? Look what Yeshua said himself in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. To fulfill them, as we said, he came to be the living example. He came to give an example to the max. What does it mean to live out the Torah? For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will, be, will by any means disappear from the Torah until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches the Torah will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Not only did Yeshua not come to do away with the law, but He says that unless we strive to keep it religiously, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Many teach that we are no longer under law and that we do not have to keep it to be saved. But how does God feel about that? Look at Matthew 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The word law there is the Torah. They're practicing Torahlessness, or they're not practicing the Torah. 
So imagine, if you don't need to keep the law, and you are saved by grace, spirit-filled, and doing all these miracles in His name, and you think that all you need to do is have a relationship with God, and then you come to Yeshua and He says, I never knew you. Is it about relationship, or is it about obedience? What kind of relationship were they in, these people? And more importantly, who were they in a relationship with if they weren't in a relationship with God? Something to think about. And as I mentioned earlier, the Torah defines sin. We see in Dan 9, 11, yes, all Israel has transgressed your law, turning aside, that they should not obey your voice. Therefore, curse and the oath written in the Torah, the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us, for we have sinned against him. According to the Bible, sin is the transgression of the law. Look, 1 John 3, verse 4. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law, the Torah. So that's why it applies to all mankind, not just the Jews. Otherwise, how could God judge them one day if it doesn't apply to them? What's going to be a sin, considered a sin and not a sin? It's all based on His Torah. We read also in Revelation 3.20, For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's what sin does. It defines. That's what the Torah does. It defines what sin is. And we need to keep all the Torah, not just some of it. If you keep all the Torah except for one, you are still committing a sin. We read in James 2, verse 10, For whoever keeps the whole Torah, but stumbles in one point, so keeps it all but one, he has become guilty of all. For the one who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the Torah. So speak and act as those who will be judged according to a Torah that gives freedom. Amen? Amen. We need to keep all of the Torah. So just how many commandments are in the Torah? Does anybody know? 613? 613? 613 commandments. That's a, a very good guess. There's 613, yes, but they're not commandments. They're instructions. Okay? Now, the Jews, they call them 613 mitzvah, or commandments. Okay? But they're actually instructions. Remember, the Torah is not commandments. It's instructions. Okay? There's 613 instructions... And some argue it's actually 611, some, you know, but the majority kind of agree it's 613. And you know it's a really easy number for us to remember because it's our area code here in Ottawa, so I'll go with 613, okay? But of the 613 instructions, there's 248 positive ones. So they're do's. Do this. Do that. Do this. And there's 365 negative ones. Do not. So don't do this and don't do that. Right? Now the question is, do all 613 apply to us today? Well, not quite. Of the 613, there's 202 that only apply in the temple. When there's a temple in place. Certain things that need to be done at the temple. And as we know, there's no current temple right now. 
So that leaves you with 411. Okay? Of these, only 40, 42 of them, they pertain to slaves, which we don't have anymore. We're not supposed to have anymore. And uh, a few other cases. So really, it boils it down to 369. Of which, 99 of these apply only during certain circumstances. Like if you make a vow, then you need to keep it in certain instructions. So some are just conditional to if you do this, then there's certain command uh, instructions that apply to you. So there's 270, or 244, sorry, or 270 that always apply, but 26 of these apply only when you're in Israel. And so since we're not in Israel right now, that brings us to 244. And of these 244, that's about 40% of them. Some apply to Levites, some apply to farmers, some apply only to men, some apply only to women. So if you're not a farmer, those don't apply to you. If, if you're not a Levite, certain things won't apply to you either. And then, if you're a woman, then all the things for men don't apply to you, and vice versa. So it makes the number even smaller than the 613 that actually apply to you. I'm just doing that little math, because some people say, 613, that's a lot, right? But it's actually a lot less than that. But, you know, in Canada, we have a lot more than 613 lots. Right? We have thousands of laws. You've got laws for everything. You've got family law, you've got corporate law, you've got road laws. Right? Now, if, if uh, you say, well, that's legalism, to have to keep all these laws. Do you consider it legalism to stop at a red light? It's a law. Yeah, but that's legalism. No, it's for your own good. Yeah. If you run through a red light, there's a strong possibility you're going to get hurt. There might be a car or a truck coming the other way, right? These laws were made for our own good. These are man-made laws. How much more does our Heavenly Father make laws that are good for us? Amen? So when He puts them there, it's not legalism to keep them. It's obedience and it's devotion and love to Him. As our banner says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's an expression of love towards Him. As all of you that have had children know, when your children are obedient, you tell them, I don't want you to go outside right now. There's a good reason. It's for their own good, right? And the children that obey, doesn't that give you a warm feeling of obedience that your children love you because they're listening to you? That's what He wants from us. Amen? Amen. So it's not legalism to keep God's Torah. So these 613 instructions are made up of the following three. They're made up of statutes, judgments, judgments and precepts, and actual commandments. Look in Deuteronomy 6 verse 1. Now this is the commandments and the statutes and the precepts which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. So then how many commandments are actually in the Torah? Does anybody know? Ten. Exactly. Ten commandments. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this 10-part series. This has all been background to bring you to this point. But I'm just going to elaborate a little more on what statutes and precepts are so you can understand what these are, okay? Statutes or judgments are connected with holiness and worship. In other words, how to worship God and how to differentiate between what is holy and what is profane. Here's a few examples. I didn't list them all because there's a lot, as you know. But God's holy feast, Leviticus 23. 
dietary laws in Leviticus 11, consuming blood, Leviticus 3, circumcision, Genesis 17, tassels on garments in Numbers 15, mixing threads and the Nida law. These are all what is considered as statutes or judgments, and they serve to show us how to worship God and how to stay holy before Him. Remember the three H? How to be healthy, how to be holy, right? And how to be happy. And these are still applicable today, these instructions from God. God prescribed them to be kept forever. And then there's precepts. Now what's precepts? A precept is God's wisdom applied to certain situations, a certain time or a certain place. Example, we read here in Deuteronomy 23 about covering your excrements in God's camp. It says, designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with, and when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver you from your enemies. Your camp must be holy so that He will not see among you anything indecent and turn away from you. So while we're not required to go and dig a hole today to cover our excrements, thank God, it'd be tough to do today in Ottawa, it's like minus 20, you'd be digging in the ice. We are still required to keep our camp holy. If we have asked God to be the Lord of our lives, then He lives in us, right? And we need to keep our homes holy. Example, pornography and other disgusting things in our homes. Listen, do you want God to live in your homes and to protect you? Deuteronomy 23 says that the Lord God moves about in your camp and that we have to keep our camp or our homes holy so that He will not turn away from us. You see how this precept still applies to our life today? It's a concept that's eternal. Precepts are concepts that apply eternally. They might not literally dig a hole to cover your excrements today, but you still need to keep your camps holy because God lives in us. And we can't surround ourselves with filth because God is holy and He won't he won't enjoy that. He's going to leave you. So that brings us to the Ten Commandments. There are ten of the 613. There's only ten. But they're special. They were written with the finger of God. Look at Exodus 31. And when he had made an end of speaking with him, remember how he was speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai and telling Moses to write everything down? His instructions, all those 603. When he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. You know, the whole Bible, 99.99% of the Bible, was written by men, inspired by God. We know in 2 Timothy 3.16 it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that man may be complete, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. So, everything was inspired by God 
A man wrote that. But there's the Ten Commandments. He didn't trust man to write down his exact words. He wrote it with his own finger on tables of stone because he didn't want to leave any room for misinterpretation where people think, oh, that's, this must be what he meant. He wrote them with his own finger. And so this is why they are not above of all the other instructions he gave because they are very important to him. So that's the background for the Ten Commandments. Now we're going to actually start with commandment number one. And I promise you next week when we do commandment two, I won't give the same lengthy background. It was just a setup so we could get into commandments. So people don't say, well, what about a precept? What about this? What about that? Now we know. So let's start with the first commandment. We go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And here's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Now some are probably thinking, wait, is it the first and most important commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Right? Look here. Matthew 22. And Yeshua said to him, You shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets Hang on these two commandments. So wait a minute. Which one's the first commandment? Yeshua says, this is the first commandment, but yet in Exodus, it says, this is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You know what, what the answer is to that? Verse 40. When it says, the entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. If you will, in these two, he summarized all 613, including the Ten Commandments. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four are what? They're all about loving God. Okay? To have no other gods before him. To make no graven images. That's next week's message. That's number two. Not using God's name in vain. That's number three. And keeping the Sabbath holy. If you do these four things, you're doing what? You're showing God you love him. The next six, the last six commandments, are all about loving your neighbor. For example, do not murder. I don't think you love your neighbor if you kill them. Or lie to them. Or steal from them. Or commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. Or covet what your neighbor has. If you do those things, you're not loving your neighbor. So you see how Yeshua is summarizing in these two commandments all of the Torah and the prophets. All the instructions. He's saying, on these two, the entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two. They're a summary of all the commandments. But this is not the first commandment. To love your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That's a summary of if you do what he instructs us. The actual first commandment is in Exodus 20, the one that we read. You shall have no other gods before me. And that's the one we're going to look at today. So what does it mean to have no other gods before, before Elohim? This is one commandment most of us do not think we ever break. We tend to imagine 
worshiping another god, lying, you know, what other god, right? Yet the commandment is much broader than that. And God is anything or anyone who takes the place of God in our lives. It is anything, an object, an idea, a philosophy, a habit, an occupation, a sport, or a person that becomes your primary concern and that decreases your trust and loyalty to God. Our God is the person or thing that is most precious to us, for whom we would make the greatest sacrifice for, and who moves our heart with the mark warmest love. He, or it, is the person or thing that if we lost it, it would devastate us the most. Nothing is to be placed before Adonai. God must be supreme in our lives before everyone and everything else. When the commandment says to have no other gods before me, it means to love something more than God. And what can be Lord or God of our lives? Us. Did you know we could be Lord of our own lives? Let's look at Philippians 2 verse 5. It says, in my, here, it says, have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Messiah Yeshua, who, though existing in the form of God, did not consider being equal to God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, becoming the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, Yeshua had the right attitude. It's about humility, right? Well, what's the wrong attitude? We've got a great example of that. You know who? Lucifer. The Bible tells us that he was the bright morning star, but he got filled with pride and arrogance, and he sought to become like God. Look in Isaiah 14. It's talking about Lucifer. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. You see an opposite attitude here? Yeshua, which was God, he took a human form and he humbled himself until death on the cross for us. And you see the opposite attitude here of an angel wanting, full of pride and arrogance, wanting to elevate himself above God, to become God. But what, what does that have to do with us? Right? Well, look at this. From the day God rejected Lucifer and cast him down to earth, Satan has sought to get even with God. And what better way than to spoil his creation, man? Satan wanted to make man sin so that God would have no choice but to do like he had done to Lucifer, cast him away. So Satan figured it was pride and arrogance and wanting to be like God that got him cast away, then why not tempt man with the same sin? Look at Genesis 3. We all know this. But the serpent was shrewder than any animal of the field that Adonai Elohim made. So it said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from all the trees of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, 
Of the fruit of the trees we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it, and you must not touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you most assuredly won't die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so what did Eve do when she heard that? She ate of the fruit. She wanted to become like God. So who? So you know that in one of the most common, this is one of the most common sins plaguing mankind today. Wanting to be Lord of our own lives. Not having to do what God tells us to do in His Word. Not having to keep all those do's and don'ts in God's store, they want to do what pleases them and only if it suits them. They are their own God. Are we following God's instructions or are we playing God in deciding what is best for us? If so, we are breaking the first commandment by becoming Lord of our own life. We become first and not God. How else can we put another God before Elohim? Living for the moment and only for pleasure. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, But understand this, that in the last days hard times will come, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, hard-hearted, unforgiving, backbiting, without self-control, brutal, hating what is good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, and what? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You know that some people, they only live for pleasure. Living for the moment. It's all about entertainment. It's all about having fun. In Philippians 3, it says, For many walk who are enemies of the cross of Messiah. I have often told you about them, and now I am even weeping as I tell you. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And their glory is in their shame. They set their minds on earthly things. They're always filling their minds with thinking about their food, their stomach, what they're eating, and having fun. Remember when it talked about in the days of Noah and they were eating and drinking and, right? It says, so it will be in the last days. And they're always filling their minds with entertainment rather than let God renew their minds. Did you know, for example, that Canadians on average, they watch four hours of TV every day? Too much TV just numbs your brain. Nothing wrong with watching TV. But you can't let it drive everything you do. Spend all of your time on it. Romans 12 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Often people can't find 10 minutes a day to read God's Word or to pray. But they can they spend on average four hours watching TV, and I'm not just criticizing TV. There's a whole bunch of other things that we can put as gods before Elohim, spending all our time on entertainment. Another god that could come before Elohim is possessions, the god of possessions. In 1 John chapter 2 we read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does, the will of God abides forever. Here we have it again. Doing the will of God, doing His Torah, keeping His commandments. We need to worship God instead of our car, our house, our motorcycle, our boat. For many people, this becomes, comes before God. The pride of possessions. 1 John says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone... Oh, that's the same verse, right? Yeah, I just read that. You know, another God that comes in many people's lives before Elohim is money. The first commandment means having no God but Yeshua. For example, a lot of people mistake money for a God. It means don't worship money and the things that can take over your life. It's the love of money that we see as a big problem. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or he will stick by one and look down on the other. You cannot serve God and money. And you know there's money, there's nothing wrong with money itself. We need money. It's currency to buy and to sell. We need it. That's how we pay rent here. The problem is the love of money, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 6. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some longing for it have gone astray from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Another God that comes before Elohim for some people is work. They live to work. They work seven days a week and they work 12 hours a day if they could. Work uh, workaholism is the practice of placing devotion on a career job or ministry to the point of obsession. Often workaholics will pour themselves into their work with no energy left for anything else in their lives. They rarely rest and may even begin to view friends in light of their career rather than as friends. And God knew this. And that's why He ordered us in Leviticus 23, work may be done for six days, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of solemn rest, a holy convocation, what we're doing here today. You are to do no work. It is a Shabbat to Adonai in all your dwellings. Again, God knows what is best for us. So many people that are workaholics, they drive themselves into depression, into burnouts. Working is good, but it comes, if it comes first, before God, then we're breaking the first commandment. Here's another one, and this one may surprise you. Some people love their family too much. You say, what? Is that possible? Look what Yeshua said in Matthew 10. He who loves father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. Matthew 10 isn't saying not to love our parents or our children. But it does say to love God more. Some people make their husband their wife, their child, or their grandchild, the most important person in their life, before God. 